Hi, good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so, good evening and welcome to the Open Gal Hub. Uh, my name is Neda Zafdi. I'm the director here at the Open Gal Hub. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our event this evening. Um, I'd just like to take one minute to give you a little more background on um, our community and also how this event came to be before we get started. Um, so, first and foremost, the Open Gov Hub, uh, as many of you probably already know, um, is a really unique meeting place. Um, so we are a, both a physical and a virtual hub where all kinds of different organizations, ideas, individuals, and resources come together with the shared mission of really helping advance open governance all around the world. Um, so that means more transparent, accountable, and participatory governments and societies. We were founded in 2012 with the mission of advancing open government globally, um, and we do this work uh, in two different ways. First, by helping a variety of organizations share resources um, to be more efficient, and second, by helping groups collaborate to be more effective. Uh, currently, our community includes over 40 member organizations and over 200 people uh, who are collectively working in over 100 countries around the world. Um, and from the beginning, I think it's important to note that we've always been a community of innovators. Um, mostly international development professionals, um, and whether they are just in the beginning of their career or former vice presidents from the World Bank, you know, are really committed uh, to the spirit of doing development differently um, and recognizing the shortcomings in, in this field. Um, so I just want to emphasize that and really encourage all of us to use this evening as an opportunity to challenge ourselves to not only learn from each other, but really to do better in rectifying some of these challenges. Um, and lastly, I'm, I should mention I'm actually a former student of Michael Cox, and so I feel like I, I have a unique vantage point in kind of how his work and work of, uh, you know, people like him relates to, to the work of open government. So I just want to leave everyone with three challenges or kind of big ideas that I hope we can all think about this evening. Um, so the first is asking if governance reform is indeed the hardest kind of form of all development work. Um, compared to, you know, reform in other sectors, and if so, uh, how can we deal with that reality? Um, the second challenge is how can we better um, avoid um, solutions in search of problems and make sure that we're always starting from solutions first and foremost. Uh, sorry, <laughs> from problems. <laughs> it's a challenge to myself too. From problems. Yes. 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 Um, and finally, the third challenge or question I want to uh, ask us all to think about really is how can we not only emphasize like the intrinsic value of these principles of open government, um, but really show the instrumental value as well to, to broaden the tent of people who believe um, in these uh, principles. So with that, um, I'm really delighted to introduce Dennis Whittle, uh, who is the CEO of Feedback Labs um, and a huge uh, Open Gov Hub champion and is moderating our event this evening. So thank you. So thank you. That was a great Freudian slip. Um, so, uh, how many boring introductions of people have you suffered through? Okay, um, but this one is not boring because on July 5th, 1954, something very profound came into being in the world. Uh, and this person, what they did in in their life uh, indelibly affected uh, all of us 60 to 70 years later, and it will affect uh, every day when we get up, uh, turn on the radio, our mind of what happened in 1954 on my fifth. Um, but it's not not who you think uh, of talking about because what happened on July 5th. 1954 is a young guy named Elvis Presley walked into some studios in Memphis, Tennessee, and recorded the first song uh, that laid the foundation for rock and roll. And standing on the shoulders of Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters and many others, Elvis started a whole new uh, vector that found it all uh, down uh, 
<laughs> and so the thing about Elvis is that when girls see him, they go weak at the knees. Uh, when guys see him, they go weak at the knees. When any musicians see him, they go weak. And the same thing <laughs> really can be said for Michael Wilcox. <laughs> and when I was thinking about how to introduce Michael and the influence that he is having, I don't know, for some reason, um, Elvis came to mind. <laughs> and uh, I think we will all look back in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the development, which I don't know what to do, how to describe it in musical terms, but it would be like what was happening in the 1940s and 1930s. And in 40 or 50 years, we'll look back and there will have been, you know, both have been uh, the Rolling Stones, and there will have been Bruce Springsteen, and there will have been everybody up through Jay Z. And we'll all look back through that legacy, and we will see not Elvis. But his brother, the <laughs> developing Michael Wilcox. And I am serious about it. It's kind of funny, hopefully, but it's also, it's also I'm serious. And Elvis started something that resonated so strongly that other musicians picked it up, riffed on it, developed it, and it led to be very happy on the radio or on Spotify. Or and so as I thought about how to introduce uh, uh, our guest today. I thought that's the same thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Wilcox is in the building. I ate nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> One of the themes of my talk is going to be that there is a pervasive problem in development. Setting expectations here and experiencing <laughs> things down here. So, this is going to be wildly disappointing for most of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo, and for everyone who are giving up whatever else you might have been doing to be part of this conversation. I'm going to do my bit just to describe in 20 minutes or so the key themes from this book that came out last year but has become part of a, a bigger agenda for trying to help development professionals and particularly frontline development professionals engage more constructively with what I think is the, the defining issue really for the, for the early 21st century, which is helping governments to do what governments are supposed to do. And as I will try and show shortly, there's just a big gap between what we ask governments to do and what we expect them to do and what our best evidence suggests they are currently doing and uh, on current pace of change are likely to do over the next little while compounded in many respects by the very systems that are supposed to be about. We're going to be closing these expectations gaps, then we've got to have a, a revolution, essentially, in the way we think about implementation. And I don't have the answer to that. I'm part of a broader community of people that will figure this out. Uh, I, I suspect most likely that the answers to these kinds of questions won't come from the university or the development agency. They'll come from the people who have to live with these kinds of problems and try and manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. Just mostly, I suspect, global stuff. Um, so that's who I am, that's what I do. Uh, I don't have hard copies of the book here, this is not a book launch, but I, for reasons that will become clear later on, part of our dissemination strategy has been to give away as much as possible of the material that we've been generating. Um, a book like this from Oxford University Press would cost you roughly $30 or so if you wanted to buy it, I hope you do. Uh, that's a month's wages for people in Uganda who are work on the front lines trying to make their health system work. And we were, if we're serious about trying to change these systems, we can't just be uh, populating our work at exclusively the apex of, of, of an intellectual or a political triangle. It's got to be a very specific effort to try and have this connect to middle and especially at the bottom end of, the, of that apex, of that, of that triangle. And this particular strategy we came up with well, it turned out to be not that hard to implement, it was just to give it all away. And uh, we were able to do that with our book. And as I will mention at the end with the, with the accompanying training program that we've developed to try and uh, put these uh, tools into the hands of, again, the people that are best placed to respond to the kinds of challenges that are so ever-present in people's lives. If you're interested in further details on 
the training program itself, you can find those in the, on this link at the bottom there. All those slides will be available uh, to you to use to avail yourself of it. So, in the theme of sky high expectations, I think, <laughs> uh, one way in which we see this happening is through the contrast with the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, uh, if you look at the goal on education, for example, the, the, the expectations that we had circa year 2000 was basically enrollment. We wanted kids to show up to school. If there was a gender parity between the, in that enrollment rate, so much the better. Um, but we thought essentially it was good enough to uh, get kids into school. And if you look at uh, goal number four now from the Sustainable Development Goals 15 years later, uh, what are we trying to do? We're ensuring inclusive and, equi and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning and opportunities for all. That's what 193 governments have now said that they're committed to over the course of the next 12 years. Um, if you look at the same similar things in health, we're going to be providing uh, healthy lives for all people at all ages. Uh, goal number 16, which is the work, um, the space in which I've done most of uh, my work over the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so, what are we going to do there? We're going to provide justice for all and accountability at all levels. Right? An issue that's plagued humans for thousands and thousands of years, literally biblical in terms of the uh, wranglings and anxiety that uh, trying to bring about a more just world has uh, presented to us. Somehow we're going to solve that in the next 12 years. Um, so these are all very laudable goals. I'm not criticizing them per se. It's good to have high ambition and all the rest of it, but I think that you know, we've set up a world essentially where our expectations are up here and the lived experience on a day-to-day -day basis is down here and no amount of uh, exaltation about the importance of the goals up here is really going to do much just to, to nudge or move up that the capability to, live, to deliver from below. And I'll now suspend a very short time going through what is a whole chapter of the book that is designed to thoroughly depress readers. <laughs> whole point is to try and show you that the state of state capability in the world is pretty uh, pretty poor. And more or less, uh, and more of the points, not only is it is it not good, it's not changing for the better for most people in the world. So, um, uh, this is a table from the book, but the, the point of having this, this group of countries uh, circled here is to uh, when you look at the look at the levels of of, uh, of state capability right now and the rates of change that have occurred over time, you can just do some basic extrapolations and sort of say, well, the current pace of change on the data that we have right now, what, how long is it going to take for today's developing countries to be as good as the countries at the bottom end of the OECD? When Lance and I first started to articulate some of this, we got lucky, I guess, and coined this expression, getting to Denmark, because it's an idea that Development was about trying to get to the top of the apex. We decided now it's way too ambitious. We just want to get to Portugal. <laughs> get just into the rich country club, and but, but I think that's sort of game over when you're as good as Portugal. Yeah. Portugal inverted commas, right? So the idea of being just uh, over whatever semi arbitrary threshold, call it membership in the OECD, uh, that we have for this particular work. Um, and the numbers in brackets after each of those countries shows you more or less uh, just using back of the envelope extrapolations how long it will take countries to become Portugal at, at the current pace. So Indonesia, very happily, more or less, 68 years. Um, and a few other countries there, South Africa at 55. But if you look in the, in the box there below, Uganda, 6,000. Uh, Ukraine, 1,200. Um, and the numbers just become fantastical. And as we like to say here in DC these days, these are numbers you should take seriously, but not literally. They are sort of indicative in some sense of the, the current state and trends using the best available data that we have. And that data itself is, of course, open to all the usual caveats and, and questions. But to the extent we have any sort of temperature gauge, uh, heart rates and other basic indicators of the, of the state of state capability, uh, roughly only 10% of people in the developing world today will have grandchildren who live in a country that is as good as Portugal. I think 90% of people over the course of this century, over the next 90 odd years, are going to be living in countries that don't, uh, just aren't able to do a lot of the work that needs to be done. So just to give you another quick example of a more specific country level, one of my favorite photos in development. So these are, these are parents scaling the building uh, where their students, or their, their kids, I should say, are doing a, a standardized test. And the teachers are literally scaling the outside of the building to smuggle in answers to their kids while they are doing this particular exam. 
high capability for climbing walls and risking death. Uh, maybe the education system itself doesn't have such high capability if that's what it takes for to get in Bihar, in India. That particular slide is taken from Bihar. The more, for the more evidentiary inclined, the graph on the left uh, just looks at the current uh, performance standards on uh, at least between the years uh, 2006 to 2010, and then the bottom ones that, uh, from, up until 2012. The point of that slide is to show subsequent cohorts are performing worse on each of these tests, not better. And bear in mind just basic demographic projection, projections over the next, uh, uh, up until 2050, will basically show you that the, pop the population of the developing world is going to double over that time. So today's existing systems, which are struggling vitally to be able to provide uh, basic education in countries like Cameroon, for example, Cameroon's population is going to double over the, over the next uh, 25 or 30 years. So the current system, which is already uh, more than creaking at the seams over the, over the course of, of professional lifetimes of many of the younger people in this room, is going to have to take on twice as many people. And, and they have this ever higher sense of... Uh, experiencing this big gap between what we expect and what we expect. Anyone minimally versed in political theory, I think, would recognize that that has always been a big recipe for deep discontent, even actual revolution. And uh, so if you want to spook yourself out about this stuff, I think you can pretty quickly. So I think there is this, uh, we live in a, in, a, in a very precarious age where there is just this pervasive gap between what we what systems need to do, what we expect them to do, and just how hard it actually is to do many of these things. We take for granted that we have 24-7 electricity. It's an amazing organizational apparatus that puts 24-7 electricity, that we can drink water out of a bottle and be completely confident that that water is clean, that the food we eat, the nice the snacks that we have outside, you don't have to address one microsecond of your energy worrying about whether you're going to die when you eat that. <laughs> if you caught public transport here, you again participated in this extraordinary high capability system that made it possible for you to travel on a tube at 40 miles an hour and leave the ground, and again, without having to spend any mental energy worrying about your safety to get here. These are just unbelievable systems that we completely take for granted. And development in some big picture sense is about trying to build those kinds of systems in ways that will be able to do the kinds of lifting required to provide education for all, to be able to provide peace and love, to be able to provide public health. But we can't do that. So, and that, and that, so this is the short version, the long version goes into granular detail about this, how, how, those, how those dynamics work. Um, <clears throat> But in one sense, we have a lot of commitment to, to doing this kind of work. So if, if I'm arguing simultaneously that, uh, in some sense, the world is, is getting better, and, and Hans Rosling's most recent book, I think, does, as he has always done, a fine communicative job of showing us that if you want to be alive in the world history, you can still probably choose to be alive now. Um, but why is it that our efforts to try and improve the, the capability on the implementation space seems to be so underwhelming in terms of what it's able to achieve. And uh, beyond just doing training exercises or uh, capacity building or uh, technology upgrades or helping people to adopt best practices, why, why, why do these things uh, seem to struggle? How can we have such a consensus almost around the importance of these things and yet have such flatlining degrees of performance? How do we are able to sustain legitimacy for resources to flow when that happens for not too many people too much of the time? Um, and I think that there's another uh, critique that another question or set of questions, another uh, important set of issues that we need to address. Uh, when you hear me outline uh, the beginnings of what we think is an alternative to this sort of current approach, not just a critique of orthodoxy, but a, a, an articulation of what an alternative to that might look like. Um, many, and indeed we ourselves, would say that there's, there's not sort of a deep originality in all of that. Um, and in some sense, no, there isn't. If you know, again, your development history, you'll be able to see echoes of much of what we say in the PDA space, having been articulated almost every decade back to the 1950s, and in some cases, even much further back than that as well. So the, the, I think the logical question for us that comes out of that is saying, well, if you guys are trying to say something that's variants on things that have already been said before, why won't your ideas suffer the same fate as all these other ones? 
uh, they were right, more or less, um, but they didn't change anything, and you're saying something in the 21st century that's <laughs> similar-ish to, to what was said before, why is this going to stand a better chance of, uh, than anything else that went before? I think for us, for the three of Matt, uh, uh, Matt, Matt and myself, who have done a lot of uh, collective thinking about it, as well as our individual work, we have to have a good answer to that, and I just want to briefly uh, give you my sense of what the answer is. I think the answer, and the first answer to the first question, is that we uh, end up changing what systems look like rather than what they actually do. We change the form, we don't change the function. We engage in all sorts of exercises to be able to change the, the, what the legal systems look like by virtue of the words that appear on documents that are passed in the various different uh, assemblies of countries around the world. And we can be very uh, appreciative of the passage of laws against uh, violence against women, against anti-corruption. You can get all sorts of uh, very high scores by passing that kind of legislation. And a lot of genuine intellectual and, and professional work is required to do that kind of thing. So it's not illegitimate. It's not technically wrong. It's just epiphenomenal, <laughs> or at least very unnecessary, but deeply inadequate response to the key factors that are driving this, these dynamics. We call this process isomorphic mimicry of sort of, of essentially faking your way through reform by doing things that look really nice, but that actually don't map on to the lived reality of people. My favorite visual example is a, a courthouse from the Solomon Islands that I saw several years ago now that uh, costs several tens of millions of dollars to build. Uh, state of the art uh, architecture, zero carbon footprints because it was designed to capture the sea breezes coming off the ocean. It was uh, used locally sourced labor, locally sourced materials. There was never going to be any hackles raised back in Canberra and the, the Australian government that paid for and funded this. It looks like a courthouse. It did all the things that sell well in terms of being able to, uh, both in the procurement and in the design and the delivery of a courthouse, so it looks great. And if you're a Supreme Court justice, why would you not want to show up in a building like that every day? It makes you feel like you're a real Supreme Court justice. Um, <clears throat> except that it only meets twice a year. And in the jail uh, two blocks away, which costs another tens of million dollars to be in compliance with Geneva Convention, so it has a weights room and each jail cell has to be built to a certain size, three meals a day, and it had eight people. So you can blow huge sums of money on certain people's versions of what constitutes the, the actual problem that people face. Whereas if you entered that space from a very different standpoint about looking at what the actual problems are that most people face most of the time, I think you'd end up with a very different kind of epistemological entry point, a very different kind of policy response mechanism that you would come up with uh, in, in, if, you, if you took that particular route into engaging with these things. So there's a whole series of stuff in the, in the book around all of that. Um, but that's the essence of the critique. Um, uh, what, do we, what do we do in response to that? Um, well, I think one of the things that we are really trying to do here is to get away from a world in which we think that the causal sequence here is to get the institutions right, and once those are right, then beautiful things will happen in the world. Right? That's the essence of doing isomorphic reform. You design things in, or you go engage in a process of reform such that it scorecards well, such that it is in compliance with particular uh, the standards that people have set for doing this kind of work. Again, no one's completely dismissed that because professions exist to do what professions do. Um, but a large part of what we're trying to argue is that if you look historically again of how the, post, the US Postal Service, for example, came to do what it did, or how Toyota came to be Toyota. Uh, it wasn't born big, it didn't sort of start with the, well, let's get the organizational uh, systems and institutions, right? It started off by figuring out how to design the car and make cars better and build its institutional apparatus in after the fact around what had already been demonstrated for them to work. So you institutionalize the success and rather than start with the institution hope or believe that success will follow the promise. Um, so that's the essence of, sort of the dynamic we're trying to uh, trying to capture here. Um, but also trying to recognize that this kind of skills that are associated with doing the high capability work of regulation, of taxing, of providing healthcare, of educating kids, all of this kind of work just takes a long time to be able to be done and is done through most of this complex work done through humans. Everyone in this room, I'm guessing, is probably the product of about 17,000 hours 
of human interaction through some groups of people called a teacher. That's how long it took to cultivate your brain, such that, or my brain, such that we can come to a gathering like this and have a sensible and serious conversation around these really vexing questions around implementation. 17,000 hours, that's a long time to get your mind at a level of sophistication that it can have these kinds of questions. But 17,000 hours can be maybe fast-tracked a little bit by uploading fancier software on a computer. I suggest those are going to be mostly marginal gains. The bigger gains are just how you get people to show up for work. Okay? In many countries where absenteeism is at 80%, the revolution is getting 80% down to 40 Not worrying so much about it. Uh, I don't think about the isomorphic solution, which would be to provide every kid with a laptop or to make sure they have access to the internet and all the rest of it. We know how to do those kinds of things. The binding constraints and so much of what we've done in the human space, in the interaction between people and the organizations that bring all these together. So in that sense, much of this learning uh, is, is that I've just described in education is true of organizations as well. They need to learn how to do these difficult things the same way we learn to speak a language, the same way we learn to play a difficult sport or to play a new musical instrument by being awful at it until you get better. <laughs> um, and having a system in place that encourages people to, and, and, and nurtures the collective capability to regulate, the, the collective capability to seek and, and to secure foreign direct investment. These kinds of things aren't baked into us. We don't learn how to do this kind of work. And much of our applied work in this space has been very much about trying to help people figure out how to do that kind of work. The essence of this deeply complicated work, however, is that it generates huge standard deviations. We desperately want pills in development. We want, we make, we want, want our discussions to be around does this work or does it not? And so much of the work in the adaptive implementation space even when faithfully designed, carefully implemented, enjoying adequate political support and, and financial backing, and still generate these huge variances, huge standard deviations in the ways in which it's experienced. That is just an, an inherent fact of the way in which complexity works in the world, is that, it, that the standard deviation is an ever-present reality. But we can harness that reality, and this is the more sort of researchy components of that we can start, once we can map and identify where this variation is occurring, it itself can be a domestic source of learning for how other people elsewhere in the same political space might be able to start doing that kind of work. I mean, a big report we did a few years ago on service delivery in the Middle East, for example, all of our an analytical uh, entry point into that was being able to map and explore and explain why it was that absenteeism levels in exactly the same policy were nonetheless really high, upwards of 90% in some places and 10% in others. We should, as researchers, as, as policy analysts, as people trying to improve the world, have pretty good uh, investigative instincts for being able to try and explore and explain why in the same policy space, most people are getting exactly the same salaries, but in the same training programs, nonetheless, the performance is just widely variable in terms of how it plays out. Helping constructing systems that help people navigate that space much more effectively, I think, is a really key part of what we're trying to do. More formally, though, beyond just sort of a more what might be called a positive deviance approach to thinking about this, the more deep dive kind of work that we do is through this uh, strategy, this, this program we call Problem Driven Iterative Adaptation, PDIA, because it's about it. <laughs> um, but uh, and let me just sort of spend two seconds, not two minutes, but concluding by just giving you a sort of general sense of how and why we think this the thing called PDIA is different, and then give you some examples very quickly of uh, how some of this is playing out around the world, and then we'll do the rest of the time commentary and discussion on the, the many different ways in which the implementation revolution is taking hold across the space. So the standard way in which uh, a big development agency like my own, the World Bank, with most multilaterals, uh, they have this enormous amounts of energy and effort spent up front on determining what they think uh, the solution is, and usually uh, in a language then that's invoked around best practices, being part of their job as being able to uh, short circuit a lot of the necessary learning by being able to sell those solutions pretty quickly. Enormous amounts of uh, initial planning, lots of uh, 
of extra driven determinations of what constitutes the problems that people have to face. Uh, we have then built into these particular things called projects, uh, M&E systems, monitoring and evaluation systems, but the monitoring is largely about compliance. Are you doing what the rules are requiring you to do? Um, and we have evaluation, which usually occurs years after the fact when uh, a group of people decides, yes, it worked, or maybe it didn't, or no, it was awful. But way after when it would actually be useful for the people that are doing this kind of thing. And most of, the, most of their energy, the rest of the political power versus the prestige resides at apex. And that's where the, the cool kids want to be. That's where, the, that's where you aspire to be. You're going to uh, be part of that particular world. Conversely, uh, the other end of the uh, spectrum, small is beautiful. Um, so we have uh, people much more focused on niche parallel uh, solutions that are uh, designed just to help specific people with specific problems in specific places. There's no particular commitment to uh, scaling any of this up to, uh, to be uh, truly national. Uh, we don't really have feedback mechanisms because they're expensive to generate. The sample sizes are too small, so it ends up being largely casual with regards to how that is being done. And the scale stays small, almost by definition, but all by design. That's sort of what is being done. Now, to be clear, there are certain problems in the world for which a big apparatus like that is like the, what the World Bank would do in energy, for example, or in road and then infrastructure is exactly the right way to do it. And historically, again, that's precisely what the World Bank was set up to do, uh, was to build roads and bridges. And the, the counterpoint to that was always the smallest beautiful movement through Schumacher, trying find the people-centered uh, or focused uh, responses to people's idiosyncratic contextual problems. But in this middle, in the space where we now find ourselves, where we're routinely running up against so many of these big social challenges, which don't fit into either the big or the small supply of initiative space, we now going to find a very different modality for exploiting that. And PDIA on a good day is about trying to do that. We get rid of <laughs> um, anyway, it's just really just about trying to start and finish with, with, the, with this very relentless commitment of being problem driven. To saying our job when we come in is not to be sellers of solutions, but to be helping people to articulate what their problems, what their particular problems they are might face. A process that can take months to be able to sort out. It's not a two hours sit around a campfire and sort of nail the problem and walk away content. The very essence of a complex problem is that it's not at all obvious what the, what the problem is, and it can take deep diagnostic work to actually figure that out. Just as you have a difficult medical problem, you seek multiple opinions, but it's not obvious what's wrong with you. Uh, many of these problems have um, not only multiple problems, but they have uh, multiple entry points that were around which it might be possible to engage with those challenges. A key essence of then about functioning in that space is that you need to have a very robust authorizing environment to protect what you're trying to do. To say that you're on a five month process of trying to figure out what the problem is will sound lunacy to someone who is wanting to, whose political imperatives or whose project management imperatives are to deliver quick wins, are to be able to provide rapid response solutions to the problems. Deep diagnostic work, just as it is as true in this public policy space as it is in medicine. Wonderful book from a few years ago by uh, Jerome Grootman, the former Dean of Harvard Medical School, goes into great detail about what the best doctors do. The best doctors aren't fast. The best doctors are good listeners. The best doctors have huge decision trees in their head and help them help their patients to be able to navigate their way around these big decision trees. I don't talk a language of best practice. I don't talk about how many answers I sold in the last 12 minutes. <laughs> they, don't, they don't function that way. And I think we've got to protect the space for doing similar kinds of diagnostic work. We need to see M, the monitoring part of our work, and not so much as around compliance, are you doing what you said you were going to do, but as a learning instrument. We've had a, a revolution in the e-space over the last 20 years or so. We don't need me to tell you all the uh, big claims that have been made about what we now want to do in the rigorous evidence space. Um, that's and on a good day, been, been a, a welcome advance. We need an equivalent revolution in the M space. We need to have a lot more work being done to help this M thing <laughs> be uh, uh, our friend, be it, be it not something that's just used to beat people over the head or sort of like get them back on the straight and narrow, but to help cultivate a much richer environment for learning. And using the communities of practice in and through which we work, like Gulf Hub and the rest, 
uh, to be the places even through which these new ideas start to percolate, rather than imagine that everything has to go up to the apex before it can be before. It can be I won't go through each of these in detail, just to show that this, this kind of work, both the book itself and the training program that, that extends it, uh, is now finding outlets in a, an array of different places around the world, partly in the World Bank, uh, through, through the types of people that are engaging with these. I've had recent wonderful discussions with engineers who can tell you the four decimal places what the internal rate of return will be on the water when they lay the pipes, but you know full well that in six months' time, if it's if part of the plan is to have community water users associations be given responsibility for maintaining the water, they're going to come back in six months' time and the quality of the water coming out of those pipes is going to be as future as the what it is. Right, so we know how to do the engineering. The engineering is a QED, it's sold, we know how to do that, but we do not know and probably won't ever know in the QED, it's plus it is so way, that or how to engage communities in the, in the management of their water. That's been an issue again for thousands of years. Um, and also just really interesting recent discussions around public-private partnerships and around how, how we bring these two different sectors, these two different logics, these two very different imperatives for engaging with the world together to have much more constructive discussions around the regulatory environment, about how investment might actually work and what, what we need for that to work for everybody and not just for an elite group. So these vastly different spaces are now emerging, and all of which require a very different kind of approach to doing implementation. It's not about ditching the old and in with the new, it's about creating and protecting the space for having a very uh, specific response to very specific kinds of problems. And rather than shoehorning all these complicated and uh, complex problems into uh, our existing systems and then worrying about uh, and throwing our hands up in despair when they don't work, let's use our collective minds and intelligence and experience to be able to build out and populate that space in ways that help us to really do the implementation work there. That's going to require a whole set of new administrative tools to do that properly. That's very much the frontier of this kind of work right now, about how we work with our prevailing systems, which aren't going to go away anytime soon, and the kinds of administrative tools we need to do adaptive work. If these are square pipes and these are round pipes, <laughs> how do we get them to talk with each other without the water just flowing out everywhere and frustrating the hell out of people who thought they were signing up to do something new and are just spending 90% of their time frustrated because they can't yet figure out how to write contracts or how to get people paid or how to manage, set up an accounting structure that won't get them hauled before some board for being profligate with public money. So those are, those are the, the real problems that are, that are what we face. Um, much of this book it was, is very, uh, I hope, uh, modest with regards to claiming it to be architecture, as it were. It's a nice drawing of what a, what a future on alternative might look like, but the frontier very much is in, this, in the engineering, is how we fill out and administer and uh, assess these kinds of interventions in ways that make sense. And I'm hoping in this room and more broadly that there are large numbers of people willing to collectively figure this kind of stuff out. That's the essence of what this kind of movement is about. And we hope that over the coming decades that this will be what we are able to accomplish. Our grandparents figured out how to in the war, they figured out how to build out a whole multi multilateral system when the only precedent they had was the League of Nations, which has been diabolical failure, and they made that work. It's amazing. Right? Read that history about how just you know, what how hopeless it seemed in 1944 that you could construct something that all the nations of the world would buy into, and the only lived experience of everyone in the room was how diabolically awful the last time was when they tried to do that. They did it. And there's no reason why we can't show that same kind of energy and effort and commitment to it. It's, it, it literally is not rocket science, but it's something <laughs> that requires a very different kind of mind, a very different kind of thinking and doing. And we can do it, this is what we live with every day, and we shouldn't just see that we are the problem when the systems we're working against seem to be part of the problem. We can fix this, we just have to make it a priority, and that will happen. Uh, not because some genius at a nice university figures out the E equals MC squared of all of this. It'll happen because we crowdsource it and we make it work for everyone.
that was like having a whole semester of graduate school crammed into 15 minutes, uh, I would say. So, uh, uh, but all joking aside, uh, including my Elvis uh, Harrison, I don't think there's anybody that I have run across or worked with who's had more of an impact than my own. And that ranges from the youngest, greenest, inexperienced students all the way to government ministers uh, of whom one is here. Yeah. So let's uh, let's take that dense 15 minutes and unpack it a little bit. Let me call to the stage uh, the uh, our respondents, our panelists, Bevin, yeah. you and Alan. And um, I'm going to introduce them uh, in a minute. Um, uh, Sandy Naranjo is former Minister of Tourism and Minister of Planning, I think, right, in Ecuador, uh, and now works with Imago. I don't think so. Isabel's from um, Alan Hudson is the Executive Director of Global Integrity and many other bodies for that. Uh, two people I respect very much. Uh, and we're going to hear from you two in a minute, but first I want to turn to Rachel Kleinfeld and Dr. Klein. Everybody gets five minutes, just give an overall reaction to Michael's uh, presentation, and then one burning question, just one burning question have that his presentation raises, and we will discuss those burning questions in a long break. Um, good? Okay. How do we get to Rachel? Are you online? I am online. Can you hear me? I can see you and hear you, yes. Fabulous. Well, first of all, let me apologize for not being there. Um, as I was telling Nada earlier, you can see my head, but the rest of me looks like a Teletubby. I'm nine months pregnant, and so I'm uh, not allowed to board a plane, and I live in Santa Fe uh, because life is short, and so getting back and forth to D.C. wasn't possible, but uh, I'm there in spirit, uh, particularly for this event, because I happen to love PDIA. I think it's a really important advance, and um, I'll couch a couple of comments in my quick five minutes into that framework. Um, first of all, as Michael said, this isn't brand new. What this is is putting together a lot of ideas that other people have been offering since the 1950s to improve organizational change in complex situations. But the fact that it's not new doesn't make it less important because it does a whole series of things that I think are crucial. First, it focuses on process, this idea that making the change is the change. And as we know in governance, bringing the coalitions together, the process of arriving at the goal together really matters for functional success. It's not just about kumbaya holding hands. It's about how do you maintain a coalition in the face of a back and forth of pushback and coming to the fore and pushing back again. It also offers a really clear pathway for making change. So I think a lot of us have critiqued the standard status quo of development PDIA is one of the first things that really says, okay, here's a whole set of worksheets. Here's a great example of driving versus Lewis and Clark. Here's some beautiful ways, which if you read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about there. So I highly encourage you to read the book. It's just really clear about how you get from A to, a to Z in an area that has long had a lot of uh, critique and hand-waving. And perhaps most important, PDIA brands these concepts which is really important. I don't mean to um, treat that as a throwaway. It gives risk-averse leaders, you know, your um, funders at USAID, for instance, a way of saying this kind of path is acceptable because a world, three World Bank and Harvard professors say it's acceptable. And that kind of branding and heft is incredibly important to enabling change to happen um, so all of my critiques are within that box here, but I'm supposed to talk about how this looks at in a fragile and conflict prone environments. And there I did find a couple of curiosities that frankly I would love to be there in person so I could confront Michael over a glass of uh, non-alcoholic beverage, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that occurred to me while reading the book is that politics is never mentioned in the first half. And I kept expecting it to come up I know Michael and Lant and uh, you know, the co-authors all know about the political challenges. Obviously at OpenGovHub, they're foremost in our minds, but everything from the measures used to gauge capability, um, the rule of law scores, control of corruption, conflate these issues of capacity and will. 
which gets right to uh, politics. And um, in the book, there's a discussion of countries going backward, not just forward. So it's not just that it takes Uganda 6,000 years or whatever it is to um, move to Portugal. It's that a number of countries are going backward. And so there's never a question of why. Why is that, that countries are facing skill erosion and capability disruption? In the fragility space, we know that war does that. But um, many of these countries that are going backward aren't at war. Um, the case studies also fail to mention political factors. So there's a large, there's a large case on Iraq, or not a large case, there's a, a page or so on Iraq and the failure of the military to confront ISIS in 2014. But no talk about the creation of a Shia militia that meant that the Sunni armed forces didn't want to fight other Sunni fighters and therefore your groups of fighters became non-organic, fell apart in the face of an adversary and um, turned into a set of, unify, of individual fighters rather than unified fighting force. Highly, highly political set of decisions of, on the Iraq government's part that led to um, that falling apart. I won't overstress it because I have about two and a half minutes left, but I just say that politics does come up in the second half of the book. And the, the problem with discussing it in the second half without the first half is that it doesn't allow the really interesting questions to get raised. So there's never a discussion of the relationship between capability and will. Can using this PDIA process to build capabilities of states also help build political will or help box in um, the people who are fighting against your, your goals or what have you? Can it reduce the space for obstructionism? Um, there's a second set of issues around uh, sort of cultural challenges. And, but again, I'm tight on time here, so I'm gonna move through. Um, there's a part of me that is wondering if there's scope, scope for reducing the challenge areas. So we all work in governance. This is clearly one of the hardest areas to, challenge, to um, make change in, but there might be other areas where it's easier. So the book talks a lot about education being an area where you really need this uh, type of thinking because of the level of interaction and so on. But I do wonder, given Bridge Academies and some of what they've been doing, which is highly by rote teacher training, which would strike some of us as upsetting and perhaps not the best way to train students. On the other hand, it's reaching a lot of students. And so um, to reducing discretion, reducing interaction um, in a libertarian sense from a governance standpoint could be ways of, of making these things better. And the, because the book doesn't engage with politics, we don't get that um, interesting set of discussions. The last thing I'll bring up is that, um, well, two more things. So one more challenge is that the book doesn't really talk about what you do in institutions that exist for reasons other than what they're supposed to exist for. And in the conflict area, we know this very well with uh, security agencies. So you might have a security agency that actually exists to smuggle drugs, that's Tajikistan, um, and moving drugs from Afghanistan up north and into Europe, key portion of what that security agency does. Or you could have Georgia, which uh, Republic of Georgia right after its civil war where the security agencies existed for purposes other than providing security. Or the purpose could be patronage or corruption. Often um, in a DDR context, when you're demobilizing rebel groups, you put them in security agencies and the goal is peace. And it's peace purchased through checkbook peacekeeping and jobs. The goal is not to provide security. How do you transition an agency like that into one that actually provides security? It's a key question in the fragility space. One that PDIA should be able to answer, but it needs to engage that set of questions a little differently. And the last thing I'll talk about and leave you with this question is the first part of this book really discusses why this is so challenging to donor organizations. And it's wonderful in talking about why donor organizations love uh, isomorphic mimicry, why it makes them happy to have solution driven problems and so on. And it's everything from being able to budget and account for problems to the very real fact that people who are considered experts in an area don't like for all their expertise to be about process, right? So if you're an expert in water delivery at the World Bank and suddenly you have to pretend you don't know anything about water delivery and listen to a bunch of people who you don't respect necessarily, that is challenging to a lot of experts. 
ideally you can grow the respect and understand that local people have solutions to local problems. But those who found their egos on expertise can be challenged by such a, such a situation. And the donor institutions we've built up are all about founding egos on expertise in different areas, education, health, um, management of energy, and so on. So I think there's a real challenge from part one to part two of the book of how we do this in our institutions at the major donor level and even at the NGO level. How do you get the budgetary flexibility? How do you get the authorization flexibility? And so on. And so the question I'm going to leave you all with is, think about your own agency, your own company, wh wh wherever you're working. Um, and if you're working in something very small and very flexible, perhaps think about your funding agency if you're funded by USAID or Ford Foundation or some major donor. What would you need to do to do PDIA? What would you need in terms of authorization? What would you need in terms of budgetary flexibility? What would you need to be able to enact a program where you didn't know the answer ahead of time, where you couldn't offer a log frame and so on? And I will close there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. And so just to summarize your question, your big question at the end uh, to the group is, what do you need? What would you need from a budget, HR, authorization perspective to bring this alive in your agency? I think I've got that. So. Good. Alan, how about if we turn to you? Um, and, uh, what's your reaction and what's your big question? Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, my uh, comments will be less a reaction and more a kind of uh, looking at things from a slightly different perspective. Um, I was going back to thinking about Dennis's introduction to Michael and thinking uh, um, there's no way that uh, I or Global Integrity will uh, ever be Elvis, but we can maybe play uh, the tambourine as a, as a kind of backing instrument for, for one band or another. And in fact, they kind of uh, torture that metaphor a bit more. And um, I kind of reflected that in some ways we're playing the tambourine Global Integrity is in a fairly unique position of playing tambourine, uh, not just for Oasis, but also for Blur at the same time. Where Oasis, where Oasis is the doing development differently agenda, and Blur is possibly the open government agenda. So, so my, my reflections are about kind of playing the tambourine in both in, in, in both doing development differently and open government agenda at the same time, uh, and what that means. Um, having uh, uh, introduced myself as a, as a player of a percussive instrument, I should confidently say that uh, I'm the Executive Director of Global Integrity, uh, one of the organisations along with Development Gateway who uh, sets up the Open Gov Hub uh, and who manages uh, manages uh, the Open Gov Hub, Heather and Christy, uh, manage the Open Gov Hub and make it into a, a real space, uh, an active hub uh, for uh, learning, collaboration and hopefully adaptation. Um, Global Integrity is an organisation, uh, we're very focused these days uh, particularly since I became the executive director in 2015, on supporting the locally led innovation, learning and ad adaptation that we think is needed to address complex governance related challenges and to strengthen the capabilities needed to address future challenges. So this is kind of resonates very much with the doing development differently uh, and PDIA agenda. Um, we do this through a combination of work with country level partners, uh, support for multi-stakeholder governance initiatives, and advocacy and engagement with global actors in DC and beyond. Um, as, as mentioned, we, you know, we're, we're one of the few organizations who's been very active, both in the open government agenda and in relation to the doing development uh, different, uh, agenda. We were at the kickoff meeting of the doing development uh, differently community of practice, uh, where we were glad that the manifesto didn't become called the Harvard Square Manifesto, uh, but got called something uh, somewhat less in uh, And we were also involved at the very early stages of the Open Government Partnership with my predecessor, uh, Nathaniel Heller, who is, who is now the co-chair, uh, or about to become the co-chair of, of the Open Government Partnership. So for, from our perspective, we see those two agendas, the Doing Development differently Agenda and the Open Government Agenda, as two very closely related agendas with huge potential for com combining their strengths, but with a bit of a lack of exchange and learning between them. From the Doing Development differently com community, there's sometimes a tendency to regard the Open Government Agenda as another example of overly normative, one-size-fits-all solutions uh, to governance-related challenges. For instance, most recently in David Booth of ODI, his comments dis dismissing the transparency and accountability agenda uh, in his in his valedictory lecture at ODI. 
And from the open government community, sometimes there's a tendency to regard doing development differently as just common sense, to think that this is very much the approach that is already being taken for open government, or to struggle to see the relevance or how doing development differently and PDIA might be applied to the open government agenda. Both of those points, I think there is some merit and some value in each of those points, but there's, but there's also some space for, for, there's more space for conversation and dialogue than I think uh, is sometimes fulfilled. Um, all of the work that we do at Global Integrity, the kind of projects and programs that we work on, and um, our engagement with multi-stakeholder governance initiatives such as OGP and uh, the Open Contracting Partnership is, is, all, is all around uh, trying to explore uh, the value and the limits of uh, learning centers and approach. Um, and we're very engaged in trying to uh, encourage and support those conversations and trying to build bridges between the open government agenda and the doing development. A couple of ways that we see of doing that, kind of coming from each perspective, one way of doing that, of fostering that conversation, would be to consider whether open government initiatives incorporate or might incorporate the key features of problem driven iterative adaptation. That is, do they, let's say OGP or the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, do they focus on locally led efforts to address locally prioritised problems through cycles of experimentation and learning that involve multiple stakeholders? I think here the picture is mixed. Yes, those the open government initiatives are often they're intended to be locally driven efforts to, to address locally prioritised problems, but there's also, if we're honest, plenty of top-down encouragement for countries to focus on particular themes. And sometimes a tendency to copy and paste solutions, whether that's fiscal transparency portals or model commitments from one context to another. And while open government initiatives are increasingly focused on addressing specific problems, and we think it's a good thing, the approach to assessing progress remains largely focused on assessing compliance with procedures. Um, despite, I should say, some encouraging signs and, and, and really creative thinking from the independent reporting mechanism at the open government point. Another angle for kind of fostering this conversation between learn and OAC is, is considering how the practical experience of efforts to open government can inform the doing development differently agenda. So there's not much mention of civil society in building state capability. Um, how does the fact that civil society is an equal partner in many uh, open government initiatives help in terms of building not just the capability, but also the legitimacy of state? Secondly, how might the practice of cross-country learning that has been a key feature of um, a number of um, um, multi-stakeholder governance initiatives, including OGP, how might that experience be applied more widely to issues of institutional reform? And, and finally, and finally, how can the evidence and insight from multi-stakeholder governance initiatives about the interplay between principles and practice and the interplay between action at a global level and a national and even local level, how can that, how can that evidence and insights from, from that experience be leveraged to drive more effective action, not just in the governance, but in the development? Just to, to, to conclude very, very briefly, it's, it, seems to, it seems to me, and to, to us at Global Integrity, that the open government and doing development different agendas are addressing common, complex challenges with complementary approaches. Um, there's much to be gained, we think, by combining their strengths. Um, openness can support the cycles of learning that are needed to address complex problems and to build capability. And cycles of learning can in turn support progress towards more open, more accountable, and most importantly, more effective governance. Um, so we're, we're happy to have the opportunity uh, uh, at events like this and through, uh, for instance, the ADAPT Dev Google group that we helped to establish. Uh, you're all welcome to sign up for that. We're happy to help uh, through, through that channel and through events at the of to help to connect those conversations uh, and potentially to build bridges Oasis and Blur, and um, look forward to learning from the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and what, if you had to summarize it into one big question, what would it be? 
So, so this, this, this is partly rely on, on people being familiar with one of the things used in the book. In, in the book, Building State Capability, the contrast is drawn between a journey to California from St. Louis uh, in 1804 and one taken in 2015. In 1804, there were no roads, the territory was not mapped, nobody really knew where the West Coast was uh, or what was on the West Coast. Uh, the equipment that people had was not great. Uh, in 2015, it's a doddle. Uh, you get a car, you take, you take your phone with you, you take it to the fashion with a friend, uh, and you just drive there. Um, so my question would be, is the journey towards more open government uh, more like the 1804 uh, exploration to the West Coast or the 2015 uh, road trip uh, to, to California? Okay. Sandy, you're the only one of this bunch that's actually been in government uh, <laughs> trying to build state capability from the inside. And I think we're all eager to hear whether you think this is a lot of hooey or uh, <laughs> what's your reaction? What's your big question? Well, thank you. Uh, perhaps to tell you a little bit about my story, I'm Ecuadorian and I joined the government of my country more than 10 years ago now. Uh, and when I did, I was a bit skeptical of working in the government and the fact that governments don't function well. And so I, I entered to see how it would be like and I ended being very passionate about the power of transformation that a government can have when things are done well, when policies are done thinking of transforming the lives of people and how much impact you can actually have when you care basically about what you were doing. And so after more than five years, then I decided to go uh, to do my master's degree in actually public administration and international development. So that was the first time I crossed with the PDIA. There was no book at the time yet. So it was, uh, I think, the first two papers by then. And it just resonated with me so much because during my years in government, I found out that one of my passion was like, how can we actually make things different and how could we make governments work better and how to create this capacity? Because if I, as I did, I believe so much in, in this power that when things were done well, you can reach the amount of people that no other organization can in the world. Then how could you actually think about changing things? That's how it all started for me. And so I, I found in the PDIA approach and their, in, in their thinking about, well, we could, we could do things differently and we could actually try to understand better how problems work and like why are things happening the way they are happening because there is something else underneath. And if you understand that, then how can you slightly find a way to solve that problem, like a, an entry point for solution? and then how you can slowly create the environment uh, to actually start affecting change and doing things slowly uh, happen in a different way. Uh, so after my program, I went back to my country, to the government again. Um, I started first as Minister of Tourism and then Minister of Planning and Development. So then I was there actually <laughs> having and being responsible of doing things and having perhaps I, the unique opportunity of doing things differently. And, and having all, all these things in my head, like all this framework, and it, for me the PDIA was not like a step-by-step -step or like these are the things you have to do and like if you follow these things, you're gonna solve everything. But it was more like a way of thinking and approaching problems was I was there in office. And so perhaps from my experience, one of the big steps away was trying to really understand what was the problem. People are not crazy. Uh, people working in the government are not that they lack the capacity. There is something else that explains why things were happening the way they were happening. For me, listening to people working in the government, and sometimes citizens depending on the situation, actually helped me understand a lot what was going on and why the things were going that way. And I was amazed how when you are willing to listen to people, all the information that you can get to actually design policies in a different way and then hopefully implement them in a better way. So that was very important for me. Then also make 
peace of mind that change happens one step at a time. And sometimes when things went much slower than I wish would happen, sometimes things went faster. And, but this idea of like growing slowly and having like these quick wings and like having and seeing things uh, moving and then creating a space and they talk about the authorizing environment, but basically kind of like buying time to make the reform. And then a little bit more of the reform then and it, it helped a lot. And the other important key for me was having a really good team. I, I felt that I had the dream team. People that were convinced of what they are doing, committed to actually serving the public, that were very well trained. And I had a combination of people uh, well trained in, in, in kind of like techniques, other people with experience in the public sector and how that combination would help to do things in a different way. And then getting a, as much feedback as possible of how how we were doing and i used to always tell to my team i don't want to hear the story of the dead people tell me why 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 he's dead but basically i wanted to save the patient and understand why things were going wrong and then how how i could do differently and try to solve the problem then and so that that has been kind of my journey and the combination with the pdia uh, in government and now I, I'm not working in government anymore. I'm working uh, with IMAGO, trying to help organizations, it includes the government, to scale up successful programs and projects. And then I've seen another complement of what I've learned before, which is basically this idea of, at the end of the day, and Michael mentioned a bit about this, organizations are made with for humans. And we all deal with all kind of like personal issues and how can we actually then understanding the final user, understanding the experience of the teacher that is actually in the classroom and all the constraints they have to face, then how can we can incorporate all that information into policy design and then understanding how the system within the government works then being able to design a policy that resonates more with reality, because one of the problems in Ecuador, in the UK, in Australia, in different countries, is that the people that design the policy are so far away from the people that actually have to implement the policy. And of course, when you design everything in paper, you assume so many things that in reality don't happen. And how, how kind of like joining these two worlds can actually help doing things better. And that is kind of, like my my passion of how we can actually transform the life of people but making our organizations including the government work better so my question for you is um, having heard of pdia think about any problems that your organization or that you're passionate about now and how do you think an approach like this one could help solve your problem and more important what element do you think this type of approach would be missing for you to be able to solve that problem. What what would you make in a different way, or what what else would you include? So thank you. So we face a little of a dilemma here. We got six forty-seven, and we're supposed to end at seven. And we were going to break up into small groups. We should. We can take a bunch of questions quickly. What's the meta? You're the <laughs> boss here. <laughs> you appreciate the idea, but you don't. No, it's just all right. The time is not there, but I appreciate it. The time is not there. Okay, good. No, I, I sense that, and I'm going to use my phone here. Uh, how about so we've got we have a confrontation from Rachel, and all I can say I've never met Rachel, but if I were Michael, I'd be happy that you were not here in person. Uh, he's, Rachel, he was sweating, sweating while you were oh, yeah. confronting me. Really uh, and a couple of very provocative questions from Alan. Friendly, friendly, provocative questions. I'm a fan. But here's what I suggest: let's go quickly around, take questions from people in the audience. But I mean, quick, 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 uh, and then we'll bring up Michael, and um, we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. And um, I'm going to be brutal in keeping your questions short. Does that sound good? All right, here we go. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Where's your son? 
a fancy Lubin. I had a research and consulting group for the last 28 years that worked with just about every acronym on the planet. And the reason for that is going back 45 years, I did my doctoral work living in Pakistan and former Soviet on corruption. So I was usually called by every acronym and they were running this thought. And my question concerned things not dirty, not the way you think. You know, we heard a lot of working with governments and working with the locals and finding your partner. But in more like the 15 countries of the former Soviet Union, where they are developed, literacy is very high, they're very developed countries, they're just misdeveloped. Um, there's been such a reluctance to, to incorporate people who know something about how the systems work until they're in trouble or faced by FCPA violations or whatever. And there's been such a focus on working with local partners, even when we don't share the same goals and there is one more of control than, than whatever. So my question is, can you talk a little bit about how you, I loved your points and they've been out there for quite a while, for at least the two decades you've been in this. How do you reshape them? To deal with countries that are different from your standard undeveloped. Great question. Next question has to be one fourth of that amount of time. Given <laughs> oh, everything else that's uh, going on here. First of all, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, can you? The basic issue here, actually, I think, has to do with complex systems. How do you get people who are not used to thinking about complex systems reality to start thinking? That is a model question right there. <laughs> Hi, Brian Hopp, Lead International. Uh, I'm wondering how your analysis and model you talked about with um, regards to state progression for its Portugal, how does that account for disparities within a state over to get access? Another uh, model function back here. My question is, can you, I, I'm looking forward to reading your book, and so can you talk about that data comparing places like Rwanda to Nigeria in terms of how long would it take Rwanda given where Rwanda was, say, 10 years ago to where it is today, based on your model. Thank you. Great. Hi, John Cato, World Bank. In change management, you need a crisis, you need a burning platform that convinces people that they need change. What is the burning platform for the moment? <laughs> Hi, right, Jake Grover, MCC. You've heralded the movement, uh, the revolution in evaluation. Uh, and my uh, overly simplistic view of this is that it's identify a problem, experiment, figure it out, it works. Uh, convince me that this isn't a movement back towards hand waving. Or hand waving. Hand waving. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Last question here. Yeah, back here, and then we're going to go to Michael to answer all these. <laughs> So, um, where I think everybody in this room is in favor of adaptation and we all appreciate it. Um, my question is about the learning cycles that you employ versus learning cycles that other providers who practice adaptation employ. How do we uh, ensure some sort of uniformity, some sort of, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say best practice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see if we can, how many of those we can get through, Michael, if you got them all in your head. Um, we'll, we'll go through some of them and maybe we'll get help from Ben and, and, uh, and Alan. And yeah, and okay. I'll if just, we have time, we'll do another. I'll see if I can weave an answer to that touches on as many of them as <laughs> I think I can say something sensible about. Um, when we were thinking about this stuff, we, when we looked around sort of what the what intellectual resources as it were that were already available, you kind of write a book, what, what do you say that hasn't been said or hasn't been done already? And so the, this question of politics that Rachel rightly mentioned, um, you know, forests have been felt on the politics of development. We said, well, if we, we either have to do this super seriously or kind of not, sort of not at all, because we do, as you said, uh, include some stuff in politics on there. But we, if we were, in a, in, for the narrower purposes of a book, we just said we want to be problem driven. And for a lot of the issues that people are doing, it may or may not be the case that 
something like politics actually is the problem they confront. Um, so if it is, and this kind of approach is, is the right way of thinking about this stuff, then we should treat the diagnoses around where, how, and why politics is a problem in the same way we would try and engage with uh, similar kinds of problems in a, in a more prosaic kind. So there's, there was a heap of stuff that had written on the politics of development, not much on if anything, on this basic question around the just the pragmatics of going about building the capability of a system to do what it has to do. You do a scholar Google search and look for the word, or just think of it in your own library, how many books on the spine have the word implementation in it versus the one that have the word policy on it? I guarantee the ratio will be about 2,000 to 1. Right? Mm -hmm. just, I can name on one hand <laughs> the books that actually have implementation on the title. So that's to, that was us. The burning platform for us then, <laughs> what was the, in the crisis of the narrative arc that I tried to spell out at the beginning, was just this huge wedge, but as I said, between what we expect and what we're demonstrably, what the world is demonstrably able to do and what different governments around the world are demonstrably able to do. And so that gap just isn't sustainable. And again, if you know political theory, just that that, that, that gap always and everywhere has just been the reason why awful things start to unravel why things literally fall apart. Um, so there was that sort of component to it. Um, the other thing was just, was just around the, the capability questions per se. And so we've got so much language in our, so much discourse in our professional world around political will, around capacity building, that we just really wanted to uh, see these as collective tasks and not so much around Capacity building is the individual training session you go to to get your little certificate or the latest little piece of software you upload on your computer, or all, all, all the stuff that's very easy, relatively easy to do. When a lot of the <clears throat> real difficult work is around build, to building the collective capability to do that work, collective, not only done as a team, not just by ratcheting up the, the, the individual skills that particular people have. About 18 months ago, when I was in India, someone just in a, in a Forum not unlike this was, and I had and I'd given a, a quite a different talk in that particular setting. But he stood up and said, "Oh, so many people want to talk about incentives, or they want to talk about political will." And he said, "This is a guy talking about the education sector in India, that sector where parents climb up the walls to uh, <laughs> give the answers to their kids." And he was, and he just said, "You know, it's like trying to ask the, the trying to reform the Indian education system just feels like asking people to bench press 400 pounds." <laughs> You can offer me a million dollars to bench press 400 pounds. You could threaten me with death and torture. I just can't. <laughs> I just can't. It's not politics. I just can't. And I think uh, we've got to have some, we, the development professionals, if we are professionals, I've got to have something to say about that space. And if we, it would just seem to us to have been a, it would have been a much bigger book. It would have been a much more complicated book to start in having then these bigger discussions around, around the politics, capital <laughs> P, or even a small P when plenty of people had already said a bunch of stuff on that. So maybe in the second edition of the book, we'll you know, practice what we preach, we'll iterate, and we'll do a, a slightly different version of it. Um, but we just wanted to say, look, it's, it's, yes, of course it matters that you take politics seriously. There's a whole field in that ODI has been pioneering around uh, thinking and working politically. There's plenty of people doing that stuff. Plenty of people worried about financing. Plenty of people worried about getting the policies themselves right. Where is the volume? Literally on the on your on your personal book collection that has the word implementation on the on the spine. I guarantee you, you probably haven't got one unless you've got uh, Rosowski's book from 1984 or something. <laughs> that's literally the only one recently that's actually I think really taken that particular aspect of it. On um, on the non-traditional, so we say, or the, like the, the transition countries. Um, I think one of the highlights of my life in the last uh, two months uh, was. Um, going to Ukraine to do uh, uh, where this it turned out. There's a, a huge big interest in this. We got an email a, month, a year ago from a group in Ukraine saying uh, 2018 marks the, 100th, uh, the 25th anniversary of the normalization of relations between the West and Ukraine. We want to mark this occasion by uh, having 25 books translated from English into Ukraine so that our students and our intelligentsia can kind of read about all this stuff uh, in their own language. Building state capability, we're pleased to tell you, has been chosen as one of those 25 books. A certain group had decided that this kind of stuff was really what they needed to worry about. They're, they're, my work is done, <laughs> right, in that sense, right? I, am, I, can, I can't, I'm never pretentious to me to sort of say, I know what any of us 
who write books like this can uh, figure out uh, what to do when you're in a situation like Ukraine. I trust Ukrainians who read enough of this stuff to say, we can use this kind of material to validate their struggle. Right? So I went there, uh, on my, partly out of my own resources, because I was just so touched by this group who decided this was what they wanted to do in development, <laughs> to translate my humble, our humble little book. Um, and so I spoke on a Saturday night in the middle of a public library with a horizontal snowfall going outside. It's a blizzard, basically. And 75 people braved those awful conditions to give up a Saturday night doing something far more pleasurable than hearing some crazy guy from Harvard speak. And it was one of the best nights of my life. Not, I don't think because of any great revelation I gave them, but partly, as someone said before, because you validate their struggle. Because they're all about, they know they're on a, the equivalent of 1,200 years, whatever that number is. They're going to spend most of their professional careers pushing a rock up a hill and waking up the next morning when it's rolled back down. And they're going to have to push it up again. And they sign up to do that kind of work. And they take that seriously. Someone's got to do it. And they said, oh, it will be me. It will be me. I will take on that kind of task. And I will probably see nothing over the course of my lifetime. I'm still going to do it. Those are my heroes. People that start up to do that kind of stuff with no great expectation in the evaluation sense that someone's going to say, you screwed up. The reason you're on a 1,200-year journey is because you don't know what you're doing. You know what? You, you can't. The, the politics against which they're facing is so strong that they can't do that. But they read. Like, we give them a language to talk about this stuff. We give them a language of premature load bearing. We give them a language of isomorphic commentary. We connect them to a bigger community around the world that's engaged in this kind of struggle, and they don't feel alone. They feel like they're doing this as part of a collective enterprise. And that sense of being part of something bigger psychologically, I think is hugely important. Um, most of what I said was given sort of a two sentences at a time because I couldn't afford to have a professional translator uh, say what I was going to say. So I was thinking, this is going to be diabolical. When I walked into the room, I thought, it's a blizzard outside. No one's going to show up. It's a Saturday night. We've got a, an amateur translator who's going to, goodness knows what he's going to say about what I'm actually saying. And the laughter and the energy in that room and I just gave them a version of what I just told you. <laughs> but that sense of being part of something bigger to me is so, so important. And so I don't want to get caught up so much on the on the technical detail. That we don't, the essence of engaging in the 1804 kind of struggle is you don't know what you're doing. The most primal task that humans do is what? Raise the next generation. You know what a systematic review found of are recently done on what humans know after roughly 85 billion experiments in doing the most basic tasks that humans do. What do humans know? You would think we would have nailed this by now, right? right? We've, we've been at this every culture, every group ever, right? What rigorous evidence do we have about how you be a good parent? Or what does that evidence show? Make sure you feed your kid when they're young. Don't beat them excessively and make sure you hug them, right? Those are the big things that humans have achieved after 86 billion experiments that are the most primal tasks that humans are engaged in, right? What if development looks like that, right? What if the kind of work we're engaged in just doesn't aggregate, right? And it's not hand-waving. It's, it's, you don't wait, when you're raising your children, you're not waking up every day and waving your hands. You're taking on a primal task that when you're holding the love of your life in your arms, you have no clue what you're doing. And reading 10 more books on it would make you 1% better, maybe. <laughs> Which is not to invalidate all the research that's done on that stuff. It's just to say this kind of work is not reducible to something that's going to come down to a formula or an answer that's published in a fancy journal and verified in the way that we would verify a whole bunch of other normal science kind of activity. What makes it hard is precisely that it doesn't fit in that space. And we tried to write a book to say, well, how do you articulate what that space looks like? How is it similar to or different from what people do when they irrigate a field or when they immunize babies or when they engage in tax reform or when they try to uh, build a more effective regulatory system of Fortune 500 companies. But there are very different tasks that we've got. We've got such a primitive, singular uh, administrative apparatus for doing that kind of work. And we can be better than that, as I said at the end of my remarks. We can create out a different kind of space, but we don't know what it looks like. If we knew what it was looking like, we would already be there. So we've got to imagine it. We've got to try it out. We'll be wrong 80% of the time because that's the price you pay to get the other 20. That's how it works in most other private sector spaces. Why can't we tolerate that kind of, and create the space for that kind of work elsewhere? So that's a, a non-answer, partial answer to a bunch of different questions. <laughs> uh, two quick things just before, as we close. Uh, one, uh, thank you, Michael, 
uh, for doing all this. And um, uh, there were also a couple of questions I noticed that Michael will be here. Yeah, after no, um, and maybe end on what you just said, which is uh, against the background of all this complexity, maybe there, it does boil down to you know, something like, uh, you know, feed them, hug them, and don't beat them excessively. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, seriously, I mean, that's kind of a that's that's a great takeaway. For me. Uh, I would be I would look forward to hearing and uh, and why not. Andy and others, whether that's feasible <laughs> uh, from a government, but maybe that that is. So we will have uh, at least the feeding part afterward, and uh, promise to end at seven. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to Netta and the gang here for running the place, and Alan for giving them the authorizing environment to run the place, <laughs> and for Michael and many others. Thank you very much.